All right, so good morning, and we are going to talk about uh, the rest of the uh, inheritance thingy that we, uh, that we started uh, the last session. Uh, before we begin, any questions that I can take? I didn't, I didn't set up the do this. The do this are gonna go next Monday, remember? So I just opened it so you can actually do something, like test it, but it's gonna be, all the workshops are gonna be due next Monday. Remember I told you because your lab is at the end of the week? No, I just wasn't sure if it was for the last two or if it was for every workshop. No, no, for every, every, like three workshops left, right? Eight, nine, ten, right? So yeah, for those three, it's gonna be Monday, the next, yeah. No. All right, so. Uh, so any that was related actually. So any other question, <laughs> suggestion? <laughs> the access keyword over there. So let's let's bring it up. So this is the last thing we talked about. Base point, uh, uh, base reference and pointer and pure virtual. So I'm just going to bring that up and, and answer the question right on that. So say I have over here and I say access cat and you say you don't know what is this thing for, right? Okay. Um, the, the shortest access, you don't need to. Just for now, stick to public. Okay. Uh, because you can, you can have all the access modifiers that you, can, that you can put in a class, you can put it over there. So you can have class cat public animal, class cat protected animal, class cat private animal. What protected and private does, it's a little too rich for our blood. What, what it does is that for children, it moves the accessibility of the parent, which means when you are doing, for example, private, all the public uh, stuff of the parent becomes private to the, uh, to the child. Or when you're doing protected, public, privates remain private, public become protected. Uh, so it, it, it is confusing and we don't need it now. And probably in three, four, five, you're not gonna go through it too. But you can research and go in detail and see what it is. I don't wanna waste the time of the class. But for now, in OP244, public is what we do. Okay, in three, four, five, we hopefully we're gonna explain exactly what that means. Anything else? All right. Create a buffer? Which buffer? Oh, that's the yeah. thing. So the input buffer. Uh, creating it, uh, deleting it, so um, we have to f always remember that all entry that you're doing to your keyboard uh, ends with the delimiter new line. So it, when you're saying input buffer, we need to know what input, sorry, I'm answering it in, in detail and I'm silencing my phone. <laughs> Just a sec. There we go. Okay, so uh, as I was saying, um, uh, see, I, I lose track of things like, just like that. Mm. What was the question again? Okay, yeah, what kind of input buffer we are dealing with? So. There we go, but yeah. We have to first understand when they are children of stream, they're all the same. You, clearing the input buffer is essentially getting rid of everything up to delimiter, whatever the delimiter is. For keyboard entry, naturally, the delimiter is the enter because you hit enter and a backslash n goes to the thing, you know that's end of data. So all you need to do, have a loop, read one by one until you hit the delimiter. It doesn't have to be ignore. Ignore does it automatically for you. So you can tell to ignore, ignore a thousand characters or up to the limiter. So instead of writing the loop yourself, ignore does it for you. So you can keep reading until it hits the thing. But if you are reading from a file, the delimiter may be a tab. The delimiter may be a comma, the delimiter, Anything it could be. If that's the case, then you ignore up to that one. Okay? And 
um, the mechanism of uh, clearing the input buffer comes in a get line function too. You have two functions. One is called get line, the other one is called get. Where get line flushes the delimiter, which means it can actually say read up to this point into a string, it, but that's only string, okay? Reads up to a string, it keeps going and hits a delimiter and stops. And uh, uh, it's fine. And the other one is get. Get hits the delimiter. It stops but does not extract the delimiter. It remains in the thing. So there are many different ways. The process means loop until you hit the, uh, the delimiter. Now, either you do it manually in your own function or you use one of the functions. Okay? Uh, when we come to I.O. in detail, you will see that with get line and get, there are two different types of mechanism when the delimiter is hit, when you reach the limit. Uh, with get line, if you reach the limit earlier than the delimiter, the, the function fails, which means C in or I stream rather, will go into a fail state, where in get it will not. So like that, using get line, you can actually uh, uh, detect that you reach to the uh, limit rather than the limiter, but with get you cannot. So things like that are uh, something that you need to know. I hope I answered the question. Okay. Any other question? Whatever makes you happy. No, I would... Don't, don't reinvent the wheel. Maybe now it's good that you're a student and you want to just, you know, flex those muscles and try to see how you're going to program. But in future, you have one function with five keystrokes that does the job. And you're getting paid for it. You, which one is going to be quicker? The function. Yeah. <laughs> Not to write it. If that's the case, if you want to do unlimited flushing, that's fine. But usually programs don't do that. If it's more than a thousand characters, it means something's fishy. You better stop. Again, it depends on your business logic. But you're absolutely right. If you want to absolutely flush it, then sure, write your own. Do get one by one until you hit it and call that flush. Perfectly good. Instance of ice stream or ice stream. No, no, ice stream. It is the instance of ice stream. So C in is the instance of ice stream. After that, they are children of ice stream and instances of whatever. Like for example, IF stream. IF stream is the instance of uh, 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 IF stream becomes file and it's a child of ice stream. Then we have other type of streams too. I'm not going to mention the name because a stream that reads an array. What do I mean by that is that let's say you have the data in your character array and you want to get a piece of integer out of the character array. How do you do that? So you can use the child of iStream to read the character array as if it is data entry from keyword or file. Things like that can be done. They are all true. And what you need to appreciate about all these objects, and not only this, this is just an example. There are hundreds of different things that you're going to face with later on. Hitting with inheritance, you always remember that the knowledge you have from the parent, from the uh, base class, always gets carried to the child. Anything you know from the base class applies. So that's why when I teach the file, I just say it's its child. Done. I don't teach anything else. To force you to understand anything IF stream does, C in does first, which means you don't need to know it. Anything you did to your keyboard buffer, you can do it to a file. No difference. You don't, you don't, there is absolutely no difference. The only difference is that one reads from keyboard, the other one is from file. Done. So it's this exact same thing. You have to always remember. Uh, as, and you should be happy about it, actually. If they tell you that this class is child of that class, it is, oh, no, 
I only need to learn the extras and nothing else because the rest of it applies to, to my, I have the previous knowledge for it. That's pretty helpful. So this is a good class. You're actually asking questions before we begin. I like that. So <laughs> what else? No, this is good, really. Flip a coin. Uh, MS1? Private. What? MS1. If you're the, if, is it a general or your problem with MS1? No, no. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, we will write using names with STD and after that we include the date. What did you the using names with STD? Okay, let's, uh, let's bring it. I, I want to see what you're talking about. I, so the reason that I paused over there for a second is that if, um, if you have a problem with your workshop or your assignment, book an appointment so we talk one-to-one. -one. Uh, so everything that we do gets uh, logged in Git so you can actually refer to it later. My apologies, I know that I said, uh, so that's, uh, uh, please do that. Any problem, book an appointment, okay? But general question, sure. So you were saying with, uh, with MS1, Date CPP, okay. A header file, okay, sure. No, no, inside it. Inside the header file? No, no, see, file. Mm hmm So, inside it. Yeah, that's my mistake. You shouldn't do that. Yeah. But it's not going to cause any problem. But you usually do all your... Name, using namespaces after the, the problem with this, the only problem with this is that, first of all, what is include? What does include do? Fantastic. So include is just a copy and paste. We all appreciate that, right? Include is literally nothing but a copy and paste. It means the content of date.h will replace line 16. It will expand to its content. Therefore, Name using namespace will apply to that date, whatever is afterwards. That's the problem. So, and that's my mistake. Well, I'm a human being, so, <laughs> so it's usually it should go up. You're absolutely right. In here, it doesn't affect anything, but it should get fixed. Yes, you can fix it when you're submitting. Um, her and then you go ahead. Only in the prototype, if that's what you're asking. Only in the prototype. If your function doesn't have a prototype, for some reason, you're writing uh, a standalone function that only applies to this file and it's at the top of everything, then you put it in a function. But any function with prototype, any method with prototype, default argument, always in prototype only. And the, it is obvious because prototype introduces the function to everyone else. Therefore, the default value should be introduced in the prototype. Yes. Uh, I, if, is it your header file or my header file? Well, first of all, it doesn't make any difference because we have safeguards. So either it's a mistake, it's on purpose. If you're doing something with the header file, uh, if it's your header file, is, did I write it? No, 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 no. You, uh, um, the header file, is the header file written, written by students? That's why I want to check your safeguards. I put it over there on purpose to make sure if you do not have a safeguard, it's going to fail, right? So it's essentially testing your, your, your safeguards. Mm -hmm. What are we talking about? Okay, uh, let's let's see let's see if I understand what you're talking about. Are you talking about the function? But, but okay, so, okay. And then, so if you say you write a function, you say, mm. then you say it just say, uh -huh. it doesn't work. You have to initialize it. Just 
interested in her name. So you're saying in you're saying, for example, let's get the cat out. So you're saying in here, if I, um, so tell me and I'm going to do it in here. So let, if I do something with the name, it says I have to initialize it again? Yeah, because the name was already initialized. Yes, the name is initialized in the header file if you do not provide it in the function call. No, that's the reason we don't have, we have that default. We have the default so we can ignore providing it in the yes, function so call. So if you see that you're in the function, say if plus and then that's going to be just set up, you mm. just say the name. Oh, oh, it's like you're talking about this. You're saying, you're saying if the name? You want to come over here and type it? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Come over here, type it. I want to see you because I don't get the question. Sorry. I'm not sure if it's going to be. No, it doesn't matter. It's supposed to be wrong. So what's the key that you're using? This is the keyboard. Okay. If debug? I'm just doing it. I'm just doing it. So whatever over there. Oh, the, oh, oh, so you're saying, so, so you're saying, and you set the name to something? We set the name to the calls when you go ahead. But it was a, it was a variable and change. Oh, I, but, but I have to, I have, I have to, we have to, sorry, it got us, I, I got to look at the source code. So I, I, I didn't, get, sorry, I didn't get the question, my apologies. So you are saying then in here we say the name is equal to something? No, that's it, we just say the name. So what was the initial in the header file? We just say the name? No, no, see, uh, there is, uh, okay, now, good question, now, let, let me, so, if you, if you just do this, which I remember lot, lot, many programmers did, which I did not like, okay, some people do this, it means I don't want to do anything, I just want to, the correctness, the, the, the true part of the if statement to be ignored, okay. But it's if, if that's the case, but if that's the case, why you like, and then you want to do something in the else? Is that what we're talking? So why are you writing this if statement? If you're not doing it, <laughs> just don't write anything. <laughs> don't write anything. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. All right. No problem. All right. Anything else? Yes. They wrote this. This is equal to name of the no, consumer. No, 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 not this one. Uh, called the uh, set empty member function. Yes. That and inside our constructor called that person. Sure. But there are some instances that we have to call the constructor. For example. Um, so you yes, you, what what you are saying. The question is extremely wrong. I'll tell you why. One of the things that I scream at when I'm teaching constructors, I don't did it this semester because I wasn't here, is that a constructor can never be called. You're not calling, you're invoking. 
in the initialization area? Wait, 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 wait. Do you call this calling the constructor of animal? Is cat now calling the constructor of animal, in your opinion? Invoking it. We are invoked. No, no. What is there? What is the difference between initialization and calling? First of all, never use that term calling a constructor. That's a huge no-no. I mean, like if you do that in your interview, you're gone. A constructor is never called. An object is instantiated. Th these are the two things. If I write over here, nothing happens. If I do this instead, nothing happens. You want to come here or there? <laughs> Please do so. <laughs> Thank you. It's right over there. All right. <laughs> Sorry, it's like too many monitors in here. But yeah, so nothing happens if I do this here. Nothing. The reason is that. Um, Calling in by doing something like this at line seven, a nameless object of type animal will get created and die immediately after. No call, you are not calling a construct, you are creating a nameless object that has nothing to do with the cat. Cat has two parts, right? An animal and the rest of it that makes an animal a cat, correct? Invoking the constructor up there in the initialization area, you are telling while the cat is being built, set my animal part that way. That's what it means at line five. But if I come at line seven and I say animal, the name, that animal has nothing to do with the current cat. The cat has its own animal, and if, uh, uh, what should we call it? If the animal the animal uh, class has a default constructor. It will be defaulted, and then in the constructor of cat, a standalone animal will get created and die, and it has nothing to do with the cat. Yeah, so that's something that I do not like. When you are writing this is equal to something, it means create a nameless object, use the assignment, copy assignment operator to copy that nameless object to the current object that I'm building. How much overhead is that? It's like eating a sandwich like this. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, why, why do you want to say overload a copy construct? Just call a setter function, put a setter function and call it the set empty thingy that you were talking about. So, Yes, maybe they were asking you to do so, just to see. See, when you get into the programming field, many people do that. Many people do that. I don't like it. Your system analyst, your programmer, your uh, uh, programming team lead, the instruction manual that you receive when you're going to a programming company, any company or any team that you're doing, they give you a rule that we like this over here. We like your variables to start with this and end with that. There are rules and regulations you have to follow in companies that is different, okay? In my opinion, using that this equal to something is too much overhead. It's because a resource gets created and gets destroyed. That's extreme amount of uh, resource usage. Why do I create an ex extra object when I don't need it? I just call a function. Okay, some say, no, I don't like that. This is more readable and it works perfect for me. Sure, good for you, not for me. If I'm the lead, I don't like it. Your previous prof may have liked it, okay? I don't like it. I rather have a private function created that does the exact same thing, a private method. Again, these are all tastes and you have to get ready for this. You go from boss to boss and all the expectations are changed. You need to cope with it until you become the boss. Then you can actually, not the bus, but the boss. Okay? Uh, yes? So you're saying you have a set MD function, but like these things you like that. Mm -hmm. So would you rather call the set MD function on the 
So if I set my attributes, initialize my attributes in a class to make my class empty, then I don't like to call a set empty function in a constructor. Then I would have a set empty function if I want to put my class in an empty state after the fact. At the moment of the creation of the class, if you set up the initialization of your attributes in a way that the object is emptied in any case of creation, to make sure that you don't make a mistake if you have five different constructors, then calling the set empty, no, I don't like it. Then I'm going to have the set empty if the object is created and halfway through, after a few processes, I want that to get empty. Then I'll call the set empty. So it all depends. And that's why I asked you to book an appointment and I'll do a code review on, on your code and I'm going to comment you on all these things. But I'll try to reason my likings. Okay, so, so I tell you why. And then you can develop your own when you are comfortable enough with the language. Okay? Are we okay? My friend got bored and said, too many questions, I'm gone. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let me, let's put this thing back to normal. So in this case, I think we had something. Did we do anything in the animal thingy? Yeah, well, no. See, the animal over here is not initialized. So it has garbage. So this is a better thing to do to make sure instead of having it set empty. But that wasn't the purpose of this thing. But anyways, so uh, shall we start? All right. Any other question? Or gladly stretch it. That you told me it, it, it initializes, right? It, uh, essentially, it defaults whatever you put in front of it, whatever is behind it. Now, the fault of an array is everything to be nullified. The fault for a class that has a default constructor for the default constructor to be called. The fault for a double is to become zero. Yeah. The fault for a Boolean is to become false. So when you don't know what is what and you want to just make it blank, you put curly brackets in front of it. That's generalized for anything. That's a beautiful thing about it. You don't need to worry about what is the uh, left value. Whatever it is, it will be defaulted. Ob obviously, this initializes too, right? So you, I can put the value over here and initialize the name to whatever. So I can say over here whatever. <laughs> OK? What about if it's a dy uh, dynamic memory? Then you're in trouble. Then you have to first allocate. If it's dynamic memory, then you put that one to make the pointer null, and then you allocate and you set it. That's a completely different beast. I'm talking about, yeah. That's classes with. Do what? Oh, you have to do it without it? That's universal everywhere. It's identical in all compilers. You said, like, you like, set it for my. Oh, my poor student. Mm -hmm. When I say default, I didn't mean default constructor. I meant English default. Default means preset of every. Not default constructor, English default. I said never leave anything to default. I didn't say never call the default constructor. No, 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 I was not talking about okay. that. Like M name is different, uh, the value of M name is different from some compiler that So have you have to always put the curly bracket to make sure they're all null before we do anything. That has not, the phrase I put never leave anything for default was that don't not, don't forget to put the curly brackets. If you leave it for default, which means leave it to the compiler to decide how to deal with the variable, then the compiler will behave differently from platform to platform because you are not dealing with the same compiler. One is the Visual Studio's compiler, the other one is Xcode's compiler, and the other one is GNU C++ compiler. But when you put that one, you're instructing the compiler what to do, and that's standard. All compilers will do the same. Again, when you do that, it calls the default constructor of the object. So it's your object that dictates how it's supposed to be. When I say don't leave anything for default, what is a good synonym for default in English? People who are not ESL like EFL like me. Pre-selected option adopted by a computer program or a <laughs> 
<laughs> that's that's not a synonym. That's an uh, this extreme description. I, I know, but <laughs> never leave anything to be decided by the compiler. Make sure I just used his. Uh, was it ChatGPT or Google <laughs> or Webster's dictionary? <laughs> oh no, Google. Yeah. So so. Never leave anything to be decided by the compiler. If you want something to be defaulted, default it. If you want something to be set to say a value, let it be set to a value. For example, if, and this is absolutely wrong what I'm saying, let's say compiler, when you don't mention what is an integer, it puts 25 in it. That's absolute BS, what I'm telling you right now. It doesn't do that. But if that's the case, then one compiler would do 25, the other one would do 52, the other one would do 35. Because of that, set the value to what you want so it doesn't become different in different compilers. And that's about default values. When you do not initialize variables, some compilers decide just to allocate memory and don't put anything inside. And some will. So the behavior will change. If you don't specify any value in curly braces, it means I want this to be defaulted whatever, whatever the definition of that object says the default is, not the compiler. Okay? So a default value for an integer is zero, universal everywhere. The default value for, for a Boolean is false everywhere. Okay? You are asking for that. But if you don't do that, a debug, for example, you say Boolean debug, if it's garbage in there, garbage is non-zero. Then non-zero is true, so that value becomes true and it's ruined. So you have to make sure you make sure that every, it happens the same way. Okay? All right. Whew. Shall we begin? Or <laughs> All right. What happened to our friend? He's gone. Oh, hello. We were waiting for you to start. All right. Okay. So, so, yeah, so we came down to this point. We talked about uh, uh, inheritance. We said inheritance is to create, uh, to reuse design. We said inheritance is uh, object-oriented uh, way of reusing code, which is essentially reusing the whole design instead of only a function. Therefore, with uh, inheritance, you can create uh, an old, uh, a new uh, class out of an existing class. And obviously, you can have many different classes created from the same class, and that has absolutely no problem. I can create a cat out of an animal or a dog out of an animal. A cat has a number of lives, the dog doesn't have. So they both share the same base, but they are absolutely different because they are two different implementations um, different, different uh, extensions of the animal class. Then we said all the actions, all the methods that you have in a base class will be uh, uh, overwritten by uh, the methods of a child if they are, have identical uh, signature, and we call that shadowing. Shadowing comes from C language. So if you have an inner scope with the same variable and same variable name, it shadows the outer scope. It's the same thing. A child has the signature of the same, same method. It will shadow always the base class. Then we said that this is beautiful until a uh, derived class is actually pointed by uh, a base class, which means as if, as I told you, if you call me Mr. Solimandu, I'm going to teach mechanics, not C++ anymore because my father taught mechanics. Something like that. And we said to fix this problem, to make guarantee, and I said this is the textbook answer to what virtuality is, to guarantee that the latest version of a method in hierarchy of inheritance gets called, you make the base classes methods virtual. So the methods that are set to be virtual in the base class, in this case we have, I think, everything, they are all updatable, which means if I have an animal and the animal acts, uh, um, if I use the animal pointer to point to a dog and I call the sound, the dog, the, the animal say woof woof. If I have an animal pointer pointing to a cat and I say animal make a sound, animal is going to say meow. 
They are both animals. One animal says woof, the other animal says meow, because the latest version of their sound actions are different. That was virtuality. Are we okay with this? Then we said that sometimes the action that you have is not definable in the base, which means when you're saying an animal is supposed to make a sound, an animal by itself is undefined. You cannot set a sound for an animal because it's not finalized yet. If that's the case, you just mention, I want this thing to exist in my uh, descendants, but I don't know how to do it now. So you enforce the descendants to have it, but you cannot explain how it works now. Two things happen. First of all, virtuality works the exact same way like the other one, which means animal still can call a sound. The second thing is that that animal becomes abstract. That base class becomes abstract because it has pure virtual method. The base class does not, uh, cannot get instantiated. It has unfinished business, it cannot. For an animal to get instantiated, it must implement the sound otherwise it cannot get instantiated. We call these things abstract base classes. And we said C++, for C++, that's the extent of it. We don't have anything more in C++. In C++, you have one rule that is if minimum one method of a class is pure virtual, that the class becomes abstract. Now, if animal has everything pure virtual and nothing implemented, still it's an abstract base class, absolutely no difference. Are we okay now to this point? And this was what we learned in past um, session and a half. But today we are going to talk about a, an object-oriented terminology that is not C++, but it is actually uh, the object-oriented uh, uh, way of referring to specific type of uh, uh, base class. So as I mentioned, if I actually have a class animal that has nothing specified in it, as you see, my animal class over here, sometimes, sometimes, uh, usually these type of classes, they don't have any CPP files, okay? Most of the time. Sometimes they do if you want to do some overloads for them. You can still use overloading and stuff. But as you see, the animal over here, it has act that is zero, which means we don't know how. An animal can make a move, can, can move, we don't know how. An animal makes a sound, we don't know how. And then I'm going to say, an animal has a pure, has a virtual destructor that is defaulted. It, this default is not default constructor. <laughs> it means create an empty destructor for it and make it virtual, okay? Why did we do that? So the descend if the descendants of an animal are created, uh, uh, leakage will not happen. It's not going to leak memory, okay? So this type of thing is called an interface. It does, as you see, still we say class animal. We didn't say interface animal. So in C++, this is just an abstract base class. It doesn't make any difference. C++ still doesn't allow you to create anything out of this. Now, in my design, I'm going to say, hey, I have an animal. Good. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a pet out of my animal. So my pet over here is an animal that its name can be set and get, and um, it can move and make a sound. Still, I don't know how it acts, <coughs> if it's tame or not. So my pet over here is an animal, but it is still abstract because it did not implement the, the act. You follow? Pet is an extension of animal, but it doesn't know how to uh, act. Because of that fact, it remains abstract. Now I can actually take my pet and extend it to a cat, and now my cat is a child of pet, and it has number of lives, and can act, move, sound, so now my cat is concrete. But cat is a pet that is an animal. You follow? Cat is a pet that is an animal. And that's, ladies and gentlemen, interfaces. It doesn't make any difference with abstract-based classes, but 
Now the, the cat has two abstract base classes. One is pet, one is animal. You can, have a you can have cats in an array of pets, or you can have cats in an array of animals. It doesn't make any difference. They can be referred to, sorry, animal pointers or pet pointers. Okay, so if I bring the um, main up over here, the implementation is nothing new. Uh, if, if you look at, um, so yeah, this is like the class diagram for you. So this is what it's going to look like. As you see, so I have an animal, and out of animal I have a pet, and out of pet I have a cat. Okay, I can't do it like this, so you can actually see what it looks like. Okay, so that's the class diagram. So you know that the cat is a pet and the pet is an animal, okay? And it builds up that way. All right? It is being recorded and the note is on GitHub. And you want to take a picture. Next time, tell me I'm going to come and pose over here. <laughs> but it's okay, sure. All right, so... Yeah, so when you actually open up the Solution Explorer, you can double click on Class Diagram and it brings it up for you, okay, uh, in Visual Studio. So uh, if I look at the source code, as you see in this case, animal doesn't have an animal.cpp because it is an interface. It doesn't have any implementation. It is, co uh, but if I wanted to overload uh, insertion and extraction operator for an animal, I could with those imaginary pure virtual methods. I could have implemented it. If that was the case, then I needed to put an animal.cpp. But inside animal.cpp, there is no code related to, directly related to animal, but for helper functions for animal, which we don't have in here. So we saw the cat, we saw the pet. Now if I look at main, I can, I can create a, a cat. I can have animal reference pointed to a cat. I can have animal pointer pointed to a cat, I can have a pet pointed to the cat, and the results are all exactly the same. The, re the latest version of either act, sound, or, or move will be called, and the latest version of it is the cat. That is the cat will be called, yes? Sorry, just curious for the interfaces. In this example, only the animal pointer. Yes, and again, object-oriented term for it. Animal is an interface, pet is an abstract base class. In C++, animal, C++, animal is an abstract base class, pet is an abstract base class. It doesn't make any difference. They're all the same, okay? But in an object-oriented terminology, in a, if you open up a book and read object orientation that ha has no specific language in it, then the, the animal will be referred to as an interface and pet an abstract base class. And execution for it is obvious. So. <laughs> Let's pretend it is obvious. <laughs> so, so it creates the cat. Everything else cannot get created. I cannot have an animal instance of animal. No cat, just a, so. Uh, Oh, what is this A thingy? No, that A thingy cannot exist because I cannot have an animal. Then we come over here. Because it's abstract, I cannot instantiate it. If I say C dot cat, C, move, yada, 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 do something like that, they all work perfectly. If I use the animal reference, exactly the same. If I use the animal pointer, exactly the same. If I use the pet pointer, exactly the same. No matter how you refer to a child, the child's actions will be called because all the bases are uh, virtual. Are we good? Yeah. All right. Oh, I closed it. I closed it. Oh, I, <laughs> I have to open it again. Give me a second. And you said last time that constructors always have to be uh, virtual, right? Yes. Even the, those ones of the lower uh, part uh, of the hierarchy? The thing is that if the parrot, that like the very first base, 
has a pure has a virtual destructor, automatically everything else becomes virtual. Virtual is transitive. Even if you don't mention it, they become virtual. Wait, wait. Are you mean, for example, let's say I have animal, I have pet. The ones like, like lion so you say animal. Look, let's do it like this: animal, pet, bird, bhaji. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. so these are the things that are. If animal's destructor is virtual, mm -hmm. I don't need to mention it in pet, bird, or budget. They are all virtual. Oh, no, all virtual? Oh, you don't need to mention. It's better to do so, so you know. More tidy. Yeah, yeah. It's more tidy to just repeat the virtual thing. Even the functions are that. So if you have a sound that is virtual in the animal, yeah. then the sound of the pet is virtual, then the sound of the... Uh, Bird is virtual, sound of the body is virtual. Okay. You don't need to mention it, but it's a good idea to but put it. Animal, you can never instantiate. Instantiate. You yeah. cannot create an instance of it. Yeah. Okay, you can never, but if this is all virtual, as a consequence, this one is all virtual. Like, like if animal is virtual, it's all virtual, so bird is going to be all virtual. But you can instantiate. See, th there, are two different there are two different virtual functions. Virtual functions that are pure, virtual functions that are just functions that happen to be virtual. Pure virtuals cannot get instantiated. Regular virtuals can. So if your pet, let's come back over here. Let me just open it up because I closed it by mistake. must be implemented in the child, otherwise the child will be abstracted. Okay, I'm, I, I have the example right here, when it opens. The reason it takes so long, because it's opening six different projects, they're all in the same thing, okay. So, as I was mentioning, when you look at the animal, animal is all, all pure virtual, therefore animal cannot get instantiated, correct? Yeah, okay. okay, now I'm going to go to pet. When I go to pet, we will see that pet implemented the move and the sound. Mm -hmm. I didn't mention, but these are virtual too. Yeah. Okay, but it did not instantiate, it, it did not implement the act, right? Mm -hmm. So act remains pure virtual for this. Therefore, pet is abstract too. You cannot instantiate pet because it has a pure virtual act from its parent. But when I go one further, to cat, so even cat, if, didn't, if cat didn't have move or sound, still it was a concrete class. Why? Because it gets the functions, sound and move from its parent pet yeah. and implements the act that was pure virtual. So everything is concrete, so cat is concrete. You can instantiate a cat, even if it doesn't have move and sound, because move and sound are implemented in its parent. Its grandparent doesn't have it, but its, pran it, 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 its parent did. So in this case, I, I, I implemented it anyway, but yeah, so cat now is instantiable. Because if, I, I, I don't remember the other one, but the other one didn't have the function act? No, pet didn't have the act, and cat had the act. Sorry, and animal had the act, but it was pure virtual. That's, that's what started everything. So it says they must have act. So pure virtual, it means must have. Yeah. So my children must have act. My children must have move. My children must have sound. Otherwise, they cannot exist. No, uh, but I still don't understand why animal is pure virtual, but cat isn't. Because animal, you don't, do you know how an animal acts? How can you make this? How can I make an instant of something that you don't know how it works? I mean, I mean, because if if everything is virtual, you can instantiate it. You, you can create it, right? Pure virtual, pure virtual. If pure. everything is, if not everything is, at least one is pure virtual. You cannot instantiate it. But you're telling me that one, once you, you make everything pure virtual, everything. Uh, the is going to be virtual. Yes. Okay. Everything is going to be pure virtual unless they are implemented. Unless they are implemented. So what is the difference between pure virtual and regular virtual? Pure virtual 
does, doesn't have implementation, virtual has, right? Now this one, they're all pure virtual, which means none of them are implemented. You don't implement it, you cannot instantiate it. I go to pet, pet starts implementing it, but not completes it. Pet creates the move, creates the sound. Two of them are implemented, very close, uh, but act is not. So pet is incomplete. Pet cannot get instantiated. We come to cat, finally, cat instantiates the damn thing. Now, cat, sorry, cat creates it, so cat is now real, okay, it's concrete. All of them, thank you. Of course, delete means forbidden. Zero means must. <laughs> the exact opposite they are. With equal to zero, it means I don't have it, but my children must. Delete means nobody is allowed to have it. I want to say da. <laughs> you, of course, because we need, like, I want to say, this is how you do it, but don't. <laughs> That's an <laughs> So, no, delete, you don't, you don't put any implementation for it. <laughs> it's one of your, like, like, things that your grandpa used to say. Oh, I used to do it like that, but you don't do it. Okay. So <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So, no, you don't. If you want to correct what I just said, if you want to do something in a parent, like you want the parent to be copyable. No, if you want to do something in a parent that you want the children not to do, what do you do? No, you can, you can, first of all, virtual doesn't make sense if you don't want them to do so, virtuality is out of picture. But if you want something to be done by the parent but not by the children, huh? Yeah, you just put the method in a private area. So you say, this is how I'm going to do it, and only I'm going to do it. Nobody's allowed to do it. That becomes private, OK? Object orientation usually has everything that you have in real life somehow be able to. And to kind of illustrate how everything f uh, falls into pieces with, uh, uh, with this virtuality, I have this one. So this is, now it has animal, bird, bodgy, cat, goldfish, and a pet. And if you look at the class diagram, this is what it looks like. So I'll try to make it linear so we can see how it works. Okay, so as you see, I have animal, pet, goldfish, cat, but then I have bird, and a bird, I have a budgie. Okay, uh, and um, yeah, so as you see, this is how it happens. So this is my uh, an animal kingdom right now. Okay, so if I want to actually see how they are all fit uh, into the pic, they all fit into a picture, this is, this is what I have. So uh, the animal, is the interface. The pet is the one that, uh, yeah, sets everything other than act. And then after pet, I have a uh, cat that is finalized. I have goldfish that is finalized. And then I have a bird that is finalized too, but it adds a flying that is pure virtual. I can do that. I don't know how the bird is supposed to fly. Does it? I don't know. Not a good example. All birds fly? No, some of them don't actually. So, so, so yeah, so that's why I'm making it pure virtual, which means it's supposed to fly, but some of them when you say fly, they just run fast. <laughs> And they pretend that they are flying, but they don't. So, so that's, that's the thing. So now bird becomes, or I could simply, like, for example, made the move, didn't implement the move. If I didn't implement the move, it would have been the same thing. So then we can't, we'll, and the implementation for it, and then I have a bhaji. Where is the bhaji? And the bhaji has all the things, but you can actually teach a word to the bhaji so bhajis can talk. Okay? Um, 
and that's how it's good. So uh, th that becomes the, uh, yes? So it seems like, you know, when you're working with the other, like, new member, like, just like massive. New member, you mean new method? New yes, okay. Do they have to be virtual? No. I just, it was just an example. No, it doesn't have to be virtual at all. Again, virtu virtual by itself doesn't enforce anything. It's just a guarantee. Virtual keyword doesn't do anything. It's, it, it doesn't enforce anything. It's just a guarantee. When you have virtual keyword in the parent, you guarantee that methods with the same signature will have the latest method call. That's virtual. Virtuals with equal to zero becomes pure virtual. That's enforcement, which means the children must have it to exist. Okay? And the rest is... Yes. But in this instance, where we have technically three different implementations of the mm -hmm. then we disappoint it to pass. Halfway through, a pet. Pet. Still the last one. But then, a virtual says it goes to the latest one, it would still know to use the class. Yeah. So, virtual always direct to the end. So, it's essentially one point to the next one. So, what happens is this. When a vir virtual method of animal is called, it says, I'm not the real one, go to next. It goes to pet. Then it looks, I'm not the real one, go to next. It goes to bird. In bird says, I'm not the real one, go to next. It goes to baji. Then it says, I'm the last one. Then it executes. Okay? Now, if you go halfway through, which means you don't go to the animal, you go to the pet and say, make a sound, it's going to say, I'm not the, re the, the real one, go to next. And the, so it goes still to the last one, wherever you're coming in. Even if you don't mention virtual over there, because the parent is virtual, everything is virtual. I should have put virtual over there all the way through, but I didn't. But, it, but yeah, so that's that. So, and if I run that, if I show you the, the main for it, you will see how it works. So in here, I have uh, uh, three pointers of animal. I have a cat and a bodgy and a goldfish in it. And I say act, move, and sound for every single one of them. And, all these three animals act in a different way. The first one acts like a cat, the second one acts like a bhaji, the third one acts like a goldfish, and that's pure polymorphism. That's the best example of polymorphism, where everything is identical, but the outcome is different based on the type of the object, not how you call it. The calls are identical, actions are the same, outcomes are different, that's the definition of polymorphism. Doing the same thing in different ways. Are we okay? <coughs> Again, this is obvious how it's going to write. Um, I'm just going to run it for you to see. Did I set this as startup project? We'll see. Yeah, it's doing the goldfish thingy. And yeah, so it creates Garfield, uh, uh, Garfield the pet and Garfield the cat. Tweety the pet, Tweety the bird, Tweety the bhaji. As you see, three constructors are invoked to create the bhaji because bhaji is a bird that is a pet. An animal is, a, is an interface. Because it's an interface, you don't, see its it, you don't see its creation. There is no constructor. If you put a constructor, it's not an interface anymore. <laughs> okay? So, uh, but it's a pure, uh, it, it's an abstract base class. And then you, in a loop, you say, so, Garfield the cat, Tweety the bo the, the, the bhaji, and uh, Cleo the goldfish will run the, the way they are supposed to. And at the end, they all die in peace because uh, uh, the destructor of the interface is virtual. And that guarantees that there is no memory leak no matter how I point to these guys. Are we okay, one? Are we okay, two? Good. And now the rest, the, to go more than this and see what are the good things we can do with these things actually. Let's take a look at this. Look, animal has a CPP file. And when you look at animal.h over here, you will see that although animal doesn't have uh, any real action, I overloaded the, 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 the insertion operator. 
So, and in am animal.cpp, what do I say? I am not implementing any of those things. The only thing that I'm saying in animal.cpp is that when an animal is inserted into C out, it's going to act, move, and make a sound. And I receive a, a reference for it. The reference that is coming in this thing is an animal, right? Do I need to implement anything in its descendants? If I do not want them to be any different, no. They're all exactly the same. Which means one implementation for the interface takes care of everything else. And I don't know if I actually did that or not, but let's take a look at it. So pet uh, doesn't have anything. This PR, uh, forget it. This is from the uh, long time ago. This, is, this was the first version of it 15 years ago that I removed, but I think the residues are still here. I'll clean up the code. Uh, and then we'll go to the, uh, the uh, pet, we'll go, we can go to cat, and in cat, as you see, same thing, there is nothing, is nothing implemented, and if I go to bird, nothing is implemented, and I'll go into body, nothing is implemented, no uh, ex insertion operator is implemented, but when I go to main, all I need to do is to say, see out the animal. So as you see in my loop, I'm saying print the animal. And because the animal reference goes to that reference and it becomes reference of the parent pointing to a child, the latest version is called. It acts the same way. Hmm? For the overload. So this is the code. This is the, uh, this is the implementation for it. Um, and this is, uh, sorry, that's the, uh, the, uh, that's the prototype and this is the implementation. So I'm simply saying receive a reference of animal and make it act, move and make a sound. Because it's a reference at any moment that it's called. So when I call this operator with a bhaji, bhaji is an animal. Therefore it puts the, it makes this a reference, reference of that bhaji. And because all the actions are virtual, the latest version of each is called and we're done. So that's one of the beautiful things that you can. Okay. Can you show me how you call animal when you want to uh, call a function on any particular type, mm -hmm. right? That's the reason why. Yeah, it's, it's all inheritance. You, 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 I have no better words for it. So. What happens by creating virtual methods in base classes, you make your code updatable. You not only inherit all the good things that the base class has, but you can modify the things it has and make sure that that modification is always used. It's called updated. Okay? And the last one is exactly the same thing with some print messages. So with constructor, destructor, and all the good stuff. So if I bring this one, and, I, and the last one is for you to, again, play with. So when you, when you look at this one, it has uh, all the constructor and everything in there. So when, when you run and execute it, it will show the constructor and destructor of all the things happening. And you can see uh, how everything works in it and it runs. So please walk through it and come with questions. So this is uh, the whole animal kingdom happening over here with, with the constructors and destructor messages, okay? And that's that. So that's the whole thing about inheritance and interfaces and all the good stuff. Yes. Yeah, it has nothing. Just I showed you like when you have an interface, if interface is only the class and no helper functions, it doesn't have a CPP file. You can add a CPP file to add helper functions to the base class to apply it to all the hierarchy. And that's, that's um, just think about it for a second, like the accomplish, uh, accomplishment over here. You write one function in your interface. You create one helper function for your interface. And it magically traverses through the entire hierarchy perfectly. How, like, how could you accomplish something like that in a structured language? It was like, like you can't even think about it, how it works. But this one, and the reason it all makes sense is that it is object-oriented. It happens uh, every day, like 
Every single car that you have, it drives the same way. It doesn't matter what type of car you have. They all work the same way. You don't need to create a new function for your driving when you get a Toyota or it's a Chevrolet. They are a Chevrolet. They are all the same. They all drive the same way. That's why you get one driver's license, not many driver's license for different cars. You follow what I'm saying? When I'm saying this is object-oriented, it, it, it happens in real life, I really mean it. That's what it is. If you're a pilot, you're a pilot. You can fly different types of plane depending on your experience. Yes. If then it's not an interface anymore, it becomes abstract base class. It means you, you said, I'm going to have a real function in it. It's, it, it. You can, it's beautiful, there's no problem with it. But the thing is that then it's not an interface anymore. Not that it is wrong with that, <laughs> okay? The reason that we are teaching interfaces is essentially for a parallel programming and stuff and game programming that you're going to do at the semester six and seven, stuff like that if you're doing BSD or stuff. So over there, the implementation of things work on inter with interfaces, you need to know it. So you can ask 50,000 things. Well, let me see. You can ask a lot. It's 9, 10. You're talking, you're talking about the, uh, uh, an inline uh, creation of a class. So, for example, uh, you have uh, a student. Inside student, you're creating a name because name doesn't exist outside. It is sole property of a, of a student. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you don't create a class out there. Name is another class inside student. Mm -hmm. uh, and for Dynamics, I would think, um, name and student, both You don't need to. You just allocate student because the class is in the student, the name. Name will be allocated automatically. Unless you want the name to be dynamic by itself. Usually, my solution for that, because I think it's confusing to, to actually create, you will learn in uh, OOP 3, 4, 5 that you can have anonymous classes. You can have classes that they don't have a name. Hard to explain. You can. OK, so the, the, in, any questions about inheritance when I answer this question? I'll pause it because I have to go back to the Schmigli and just uh, to the main one. Repeat the answer. Answer to what, my friend? The, the question was, what happens if I have a class and I create a class inside a class, not outside? And I said, pause. Let's finish with the inheritance. We'll talk about that in a second. All right. So let's go back to the main one. Let's say I want to have a class for a name with first name and last name, but I don't want to create a name at all. I am going to only use it once. I don't want to recreate this class ever. So I want to package two things in a variable, but I don't want to recreate another one of it. So I can actually create something like this. I can say class, character first, say 21, character last, say 31, and in here I say name. Name over there is an object of type nothing, of type of that class. So name has a first and has a last, but you cannot create a new one out of it. Then you put, then, uh, so you're saying, uh, you, yeah. so you're saying, you're saying I have something like this. I have a uh, class uh, student, dent, student, dent, all right. And if I can, this IntelliSense is killing me. 
I don't want you here. There you go. All right. Like this, and then I have, what do I have? Uh, public, um, oh, public, something like this, right? And now you want to pass, so pass a name to that name thingy, or so I'm saying over here, student. Oh, so, and you want these to be dynamic, is that what you're saying? Uh, so this one is dynamic? Oh, and you're saying... So, uh, words are an array of characters, and the lines are arrays of words. So, we have two... Um, did I create it that way? Do we have a class for words? No, no, we don't. It's oh, just oh. A, friend, a friend to the other class. Oh, okay. But the creation of the, the second class is based on the first class. So, that one was a private class that we had, I think. Like a yeah, pro yeah, fully private. Yeah, fully private class. It, uh, th when it's fully private, so this is one that... First of all, let me t tell you how this one works, <laughs> okay? Which is nuts, but I'm gonna tell you how it works. So to actually instantiate a student, student like this, if I create a student uh, character pointer first, and a constant, sorry. Const character pointer first, and const character pointer last, and if I want to uh, now instantiate that name, in here I'll simply go in initialization area, I'll go name, and in here I'm gonna say new uh, character 21, and new nuts, but that's what it is, new character 31. So now your name is dynamic, okay? So uh, is it good now? Pardon me? Yeah, um, but the thing is that it because it's a class, I have to make it a struct. I think what happened? Uh, oh, give me a second. There we go. Yeah, because then I have to put a constructor for it. I'm lazy. Okay, I just, because it's private. Everything's private. How can it set it? Right? I made it struct, so it's, or I could put public over there. So now I'm using the universal thing, saying the first one's going to be new, the second one's going to be that, right? Now if you want to create, now that becomes too heavy. I'm not going to go. But that's what it is. So this is what. Your answer is the same. If you have a private class that only student has access. So if I created this like this. So if I said class name. And this is fully private class. But the only thing that I had over here was a forward declaration of class student, prototype for that one, and here I had friend class student. Because uh, 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 only a student can have a name and nothing else. Very bad example because uh, an employee can have a name too, but hey, okay? So now if I want to instantiate that name, what do I do? And obviously, in here I have, in here I have name, uh, m name, right? Correct. Done. Okay. So what happens over here again? Because that's a class and it's going to be yada yada yada. But I, I can set it up and and do whatever is needed. But but what you do if if I have it like let's put it like this. So I'm going to say over here public. And even, let's remove that new thingy out of here and make it better. So in here, I'm going to say public, uh, no, not public, uh, sorry, name, um, uh, const character pointer first, const character pointer last. And in here, I'll do uh, uh, the, what should we call it, the initialization. I need C string now while it's growing bigger and bigger. So I'm going to make it C string now, C string, and in here I would go 
um, uh, first is set to new um, character str len of f plus one, right? And we have the same thing for the last. And it's going to be last plus one, correct? That's what we're going to do, and then do the copying thingy. So str copy into first f, and str copy into last uh, second one. And, and now we have this. Now in here, what you need to do is to say over here, m name first and last. So you were saying, although it, it, it is like that, so you can, even if it wasn't a friend and um, you didn't have, but the constructor was public, it was the same way. You loop, you one by one delete. If you have 50 pointers, each pointer is pointing to an array of dy dynamic array, you write, so you, you don't know how to create a dynamically allocated pointer. So forget about that, that's OOP 2, 3, 4, 5. Those are pointer to pointers. We don't want to talk about that. You have an array of pointers, that you can do. You have an array of pointers and each one is pointing to an array. So the array of pointers is not dynamic, but the target of each element is. So you keep track of how many you have, so you, the array of pointers is 500, you only use the first 50. You keep track of that one. When you delete, or you make everything null, and you just delete everything, right to the end, it doesn't matter. It deletes the ones that, are, that have something, and the ones that are null, nothing happens. Or you keep track of the number, and you do the first 50 only. As you're adding, you add to the number. Yes, sir. The first one, the first array. You're talking about the array of pointers? Array of pointers. Don't know if you don't know that one, then you need to have a dynamic array of yeah. pointers. And that thing, don't the, it to the array yes, so, so what you need to do, so first you go and see how many lines you have. Then you dynamically allocate an array of pointers. Then each one will point. So first you delete everything one by one in a loop. Then you delete the main array. Yes. Yes, of course. And, uh, Otherwise, how does how does it know that the student is a friend? There is a class called student. Oh, forward declaration is uh, just putting the name of the class with nothing in it. That's a forward declaration. It's a prototype for a class. A prototype for a class is just a class and the name of the class. But, 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 compiler only knows it's a class. That's it. You can use a pointer. You can use a reference in there. You cannot in any way instantiate the student. Instantiation happens after the class is fully developed. Chicken and the egg. Which one came first? Chicken and the egg, which one came first? No, chicken and the egg, which one came first? Can you answer that question? The egg. <laughs> <laughs> what laid it? The chicken. <laughs> Where it came from? The egg. What laid it? So I would say evolution. They all came to but But no, the thing is that, the thing is that, if I put the student at the top, then how do you have an instance of inside the student? Because the name is being instantiated, I need to have the real name before that. But in here, I'm just saying, who's your, bo who's your daddy? <laughs> or something. <laughs> or who's your friend? <laughs> OK? Because of that, I say friend class. So I'm not instantiating the student in here. I'm just referring it. <laughs> Sorry, I have to make it funny so, so people kind of cheer up. But apparently only one person got the joke and the rest of you are. <laughs> anyway, so, so yeah, so, so yeah, because the, the student doesn't need to get instantiated to be friend of name, 
then I put the uh, uh, homework declaration for the student at the top. So student can instantiate the name. That's all. Which I'm surprised. I'll take. I'll take a look at it. Maybe. Maybe I don't know. It, in, in original C plus plus, it didn't work. Maybe version uh, twenty has something in it. That C plus plus twenty, they said we're gonna. I don't know when. I don't. Know, I don't. Maybe. Maybe when you say friend class student, then this class student tells that it's student. It's it's students a class because of the. Yeah, I know. What I'm saying is that when you say friend, friend, class, student, you're essentially telling the compiler the student is a class. So it knows it's a class. So the same information is provided. But that forward declaration, don't leave it for default. In some compilers, it may not work. OK, okay so make sure you put it at the top. OK, anything else? Yes, sir. Oh, it started in a very fishy way. I was surfing the net and missed the information. Is holy mother. Okay, go. I just did it two seconds ago. I just did it. I st like two seconds. We had we had the name inside the student, didn't we? We did it. Look, watch the recording. <laughs> you were napping at the time. <laughs> that was her original question. All right. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, any other question? Loop. How the group? Let's say student has many names. <laughs> um, yeah, it's still. Um, or mm, many subjects. So I have a subject over here. No, I'm just. Gonna, I'm not going to do it that way. I'm just going to do it like this. So I have over here integer pointer uh, nums, and let's say twenty of them. Okay, and nums zero is equal to new nums new int twenty. This is actually a crooked type of array when you look at it. OK, so now I have an array of pointers of nums. And the first one, 0 has 20, 1 has 10, 2 has 200, 3 has 120, 4 has 20. And so it's a crooked type of two-dimensional array. OK, so first of all, I would do this because I said when you create a pointer, make sure it's null. That takes care of that. Everything becomes null, right? Now I'm going to say 4. Uh, integer i set to 0, i less than 20, and i plus plus. And I'll go delete nums i. So the first six will actually delete. And the rest, because they are null, nothing happens. Because, oh, seven. Okay. The first seven we actually get deleted. And the rest, well, nothing will happen because they're all null. If you didn't go that way, if you actually you wanted to write it efficient, you would have known that you actually have seven. So you would go integer i zero and i less than uh, seven, i plus plus, then we go all the first step. No, 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 no. That was a question, OP345 question he asked. If this is a dynamic array of pointers, too rich for our blood, that's pointer to pointer. You want me to write the code for it? <laughs> Let's do it private. Because that's going to then, I know this, I did that once. Then it comes in people's assignment. They're going to come and it, it doesn't work. 
And I'm like, that's not the level now, okay? But essentially, a pointer to a pointer is created like this. Just, I'm, we, I'm not gonna do the dynamic thing just to show you. So if I have integer pointer A, if I want to have the address of A somewhere, I have to say integer pointer pointer P that holds the address of A. Now if I want to hold the address of P in Q, it's gonna be integer point, integer pointer 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 Q that holds the address of P. So now if I want to go to A or to, from Q, then I have to say uh, pointer, so that's, so this is Q. Q has the at, where is it? Q, Q, Q. Oh, and let's do this. Integer I, right, and I'm gonna say A is set to address of I. So I'm gonna write Q, okay. So this Q is address of what? P, correct? So this becomes P itself. But P itself is address of what? So this becomes A itself. A is address of what? So this becomes I. So now if I say over here 10, that essentially means I is set to 10. So let's not go through it, okay? I don't wanna go through that, okay? Uh, then I have to explain to you how to create, no, I, that's, uh, some, because uh, pointers and arrays are a little bit iffy, at the moment, let's just stick to baby steps. Go with this for now. Later on, we're going to learn how arrays of pointers are allocated. Yes, ma'am. So, um, you know how we're saying pointers? Actually, we have six. Um, yes. Oh, well, actually, we have two. May, may, I, may I stop to write right away with it? Size of is not that at all. Now I, I'll, explain, I'll explain what it is. Okay. <clears throat> size of looks at the type and tells you what is the size of allocated memory for that. It only forks for the local array. So, so this is answered now with, uh, so I'm gonna say over here deleting. So what you're saying is this, if I have over here, so in here if I say integer a 50, okay, and I say, si and I'm gonna say C out size of a. Right? And now I'm gonna do this. Integer foo of void foo. Um, integer array like that. And in here I'm gonna say C out size of ARR. Are we good? Now in here I'm gonna say Foo A. Are we clear what my example is trying to do? I'm first creating an array, 50, and I'm gonna say what is the size of the array. And let's actually do even better than that. I'm gonna say integer pointer P, and I'm gonna say is equal to new int a thousand. And in here I'm gonna say C out size of P. The common mistake is that size of tells you what is the size of whatever is in front of it, which is not entirely right. Let's walk through it one by one and see what happens. If it even compiles. Let's see if this thing comp compiles. I hope it compiles. It did compile. Okay. So... Oh, it went to cat? Okay, just a second, sorry, sir. <laughs> okay, it does not compile. Let me just come over here and say set a startup project. Now let's see if it compiles. 
No, it does not. OSTR copy. Oh, please. Um, uh, CRT secure, no warnings. Okay, one more time. Now it's better. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So now I have that. If I say size of A, first of all, it's going to say 200. Why? Because each integer occupies how much space? So size of A is, so you cannot just see what is the size of A. You have to say divide, you have to say size of A divided by size of integer. That's going to tell you what is the size of that array. In this scope, but now take a look. I am passing the exact same thing over there to the ARR, correct? So it's going to go up to foo, right? Now it's going to say, show what is the size. And look at that. It tells you what is the size of ARR. What is ARR? An integer pointer. How much space an integer pointer occupies? Eight. Right? And it comes down. Now I'm asking, what is the size of P that is pointing to 1,000 integers? Again, 8. So size of has nothing to do with the size of an array. In a local scope, it happens to tell you what is the total memory an array occupies because it's in the local scope. If you go out of that, it has no idea if this is an array or a pointing to point to. So it tells you what is the size of the current thing that you're putting in. We can't. Impossible in C language. C language does not have that capability. What C++ has. And that's standard template library that we learn at the end of the, we learn in OP345. So what they did, actually, you know what? What is the time? 36, too late. You asked this question earlier, I would have actually implemented for you. But uh, uh, we can do it the next time. For the, uh, so when you're coming for the lab, remind me of the exact same to question together. I'm going to create an array for you that knows what is its size. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> next, uh, next week, sure. Uh, well, okay. Anyway, so anyone else? Please remind me of that. Okay. And then next week. Okay. What did you just say? Repeat that. No, no. What, what do you use what? What do you use what? STR. What STR stands for? And what does string length do? String length counts one by one until it hits the null pointer. It has nothing to do with. That's a very common mistake. Thank you for asking. OK. What you have to remember, STR len, size of a standard way Programmers mark the end of data in characters, which means keep looking for bytes until you hit the null and you stop. Okay? Is that a question? That's the that's the fee, that's that's the beauty of virtuality. It doesn't care. It goes to the latest version. Exactly. We good. It's the end of the class, and the next day we are coming in. We're gonna create ourselves some arrays, and something that an array that actually knows what is its size. It, it can resize itself. An array that uh, you create. F an array of 50 integers, if you go to 51, it's not going to give you an error. It just resizes itself to its size. We, we will create that together, OK? All right. And we do that using, un momento, por favor. Uh, please just give me a second. I got to look at something before we.
please log me in, please log me in, don't ask for the password. Yes. Okay, we are section A, correct? That well, doesn't matter, actually. I just want to go to the uh, weekly schedule. How do you go to the weekly schedule? Yes, the next day you are coming in, uh, we're going to do templates. So doing templates, we're gonna actually, I'm going to actually teach you to create arrays of your own. Okay? That's going to be a full day. All right? But first, we're going to do a regular one, and then we're going to make a, a, a real thing that you can actually use in your programs. Instead of using an array, you can actually use that. All right, have yourself a beautiful, actually, we are early, it's the 9.45 it ends? 45. Okay, five minutes, any questions? <laughs> any question one? Any question two? Sold, okay, done. Have a, oh, really? <laughs> What's up? These documents. Yeah, you have to get connected to. That's why uh, I put downloadable thing. Okay, everyone. Important question came up. Listen to this. If you cannot go to the questions, if you cannot go to the material, I put the downloadable ones here. Downloadable OP two four four B three two hundred notes. Clone that. Everything is in there. All right, have a beautiful day. Until I make it better for next semester.